happen next. And so here we are um, six months later or so, and we're, we're still in the midst of it and uh, still have lots of questions and trying to figure out what happens next. And so uh, we want to get right into it. And I'm going to ask some questions out of the gate that I, I have, frankly, as a representative and that people have already um, emailed me about. And then people are going to be popping in and posting their questions live as well. So, um, you know, maybe if you can just, again, introduce yourself, David, tell us about what you do at UC Davis Health System. And, uh, and then uh, just an overview of where we're at with, uh, with, with COVID-19 in our country and state. Sure. Well, that's well. That's a big question, of course. Um, so I'm David Labarsky. I'm a uh, academic anesthesiologist by uh, training. Um, now running the UC Davis Health System, which includes the uh, School of Medicine, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, uh, the UC Davis Medical Center, all of its outreach activities, um, and basically everything that's on the 150-acre Sacramento campus, plus all of our outreach clinics. Um, and um, from that perspective. Um, I have become a reluctant uh, expert in COVID-19 and in vaccinology because it is incumbent upon leaders everywhere to really understand um, what's going on with the people that they serve, the patients that they serve, the employees that they serve, um, and making sure that we're making the right decisions to keep everyone, every single person in this area as safe as humanly possible, and to get immunity up as soon and as quickly as possible. So. Um, with COVID-19, I'll just spend two minutes. Um, it is a sad fact that the public health message has been torn asunder by politici politicization of whether or not public health measures work. I want to state unequivocally for everybody, because this is the most important thing that anybody can do, wear a mask. Masks work. Masks work to decrease your transmission of the virus should you be sick. And masks work to prevent you from getting the virus if you're not sick. And it's a really very simple equation here. And this is, we really do understand this now. It's really a matter of how much exposure you have to how many virus particles. And if you get enough exposure for a long enough period of time, they will overwhelm your normal peripheral defenses against getting sick. So masks are the single most effective thing that you can do. And right after that, is physical distancing by six feet. And the worst things that you can do, the things that carry the greatest amount of risk are congregating indoors, talking or singing in an animated fashion and not wearing a mask and not having a tremendous amount of air circulation. We know this. And if we would just adhere to doing this, we would be so much safer as we get to the final answer up to this pandemic that we are at the beginning of the end of this pandemic as we begin to administer the vaccine, which is literally coming around the corner. Um, at UC Davis Health, we expect to get our first few thousand doses um, on uh, Monday. Um, Kevin, want me to continue on about the vaccine too and just let people know where that is? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's focus on that for a bit and just and tell us the latest. So today the, the FDA came out and approved um, the uh, the vaccine. So Pfizer is shipping these these uh, doses out all across our nation. So as you said, Davis will get their first on um, on Monday. So maybe you could just talk about what that means and this first vaccine, um, sure. and then and other vaccines that may be coming around the corner. Right. So um, Pfizer should have about fifty million doses available to the United States of America. California, um, they're shipping about six million or so uh, this week. Um, uh, California will receive 327,000 doses. Um, that's not a ton. That's enough to get to about 1% of our population, um, and not even. And, um, but so it's gonna go first to healthcare workers and those who live in, assist in uh, congregate living who are elderly because they're at such, such high risk. Uh, still, uh, if they catch it, the death rate is still about three out of 10. Um, if, if they get it. So these, these decisions are made at a national level and I think very wise, and they allow us to continue to take care of you um, so that we actually have enough staff in the hospital should you get sick to actually administer to you. Um, that 
vaccine is uh, very difficult to distribute. It must be stored at negative 80 degrees. Um, you know, just to get an idea, your, your freezer is, you know, a little bit below freezing temperature. You know, this is like 100 degrees below freezing temperature. It's really cold. So it takes special equipment. Uh, UC Davis is very lucky as a very large trauma center that does a lot of infusions and a research university. We have a tremendous number of these special freezers, and we're one of seven institutions in the state uh, that are uh, a distribution point. That is, we'll get the uh, drug in, and then we'll send it out uh, once uh, California Department of Public Health tells us where else to send it. Um, uh, they're not, the, the drug that we get is not for us, it's for everyone in our, in our region. Um, and um, the vaccine itself is what's called a messenger RNA vaccine, relatively new in terms of the way it was manufactured, but there are other messenger RNA vaccines out there like Shingrix, uh, which is the shingles vaccine. Um, and the, the key here in the way all vaccines work, I wanna take a step back is, you know, your body recognizes things inside of it that are not your body. That is, it says, you're a foreign invader. I'm going to mount a re reaction. I'm going to re mount a response. And if I see this again, I'm going to mount a really big response. And so what the messenger RNA does, it's, it's, it, it basically, you inject that. And it's, a, it's a little snippet of how a virus replicates itself, because that's how viruses cause disease. They, they double and they double. They, they split themselves in two and they, they replicate. Um, and um, the messenger RNA is being injected that actually has a, a code in it to make a critical part of the outside of the virus. It is not the virus. It can't cause the virus. It can't cause disease. But the body, when your body gets the injection, it will make a little bit of this surface protein on the virus. And then your body will have a memory for it. And it will kill the virus should it get into your body. That's how vaccines work. This one seems to work remarkably well along the lines of some of the best results ever. Things like measles, which last a lifetime is like a 98, 99% efficacy rate, um, which means how it works in uh, perfect controlled conditions. This one is a 95% from both Pfizer and Moderna. So near the top of our vaccines that we've ever developed in the United States. So uh, talk about too, what, how, how confident you are that we'll get other um, pharmaceutical companies with their vaccines out in the, in the near future. So there's Moderna and then AstraZeneca um, just around the corner. And so, you know, those three combined still only, you know, I think impact um, less than a quarter of the population. So we need much more than that. So how optimistic are you that we'll have others soon? Um, well, a hundred percent for sure. So just again, to get to herd immunity, you need 60% of people either infected with active antibodies still in their blood or who have been vaccinated. Um, the vaccine we've shown, it seems that antibodies last at least six months. That's, that's how much data they have. Um, if you assume that about 10% of the American population, which is 330 million people, have had the disease at one point or another, we've got to get the vaccine to at least 50% of Americans or another 165 million doses right out there. And so this is a big hurdle. Not, no one company has enough. Moderna, 99.9% .9 will be approved next week. Um, between the two of those uh, drug uh, companies, we should be able to get 100 million people vaccinated. Still not quite where we need to be. So we'll need a third company or some sort of amazing ramp up of production by the first two. Um, and AstraZeneca, not sure yet. I mean, that data is still under a lot of uh, scrutiny. Um, we are participating in a new randomized trial for something from Novavax. Um, and uh, we will continue to look for other vaccines. The problem is, as you might imagine, who wants to get a placebo in a clinical trial? And that is not, you know, get a fake drug when a real drug from Pfizer or Moderna is actually approved and available mm -hmm. for administration. It will make doing the research much more difficult going forward. Yeah, and so the, the human guinea pigs, essentially. Who wants to do that when you get the real thing right here? Right, right, right. So um, I don't know how that's all gonna be rolled out. We're gonna look to the experts like Tony Fauci and others who uh, guide uh, 
the NIH and the leaders of the CDC and the FDA, you know, to get us to where we need to be. And um, I think that hopefully as um, our administration changes, we will get a singular and consistent message about how to protect ourselves as well as how to produce drugs at the most rapid rate possible. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so before we get more, I have a few more vaccine questions. So uh, remind uh, people out there and me that UC Davis played, is playing a key role in these, um, in these vaccination trials that when Operation Warp Speed uh, first launched, uh, UC Davis is a significant partner. So tell us more about UCD. Right. Well, so we have a very large clinical trials uh, engine. We do a lot of clinical trials, a natural fit actually for this. But more importantly, we were one of the largest recruiters within the trial and within that group of people we recruited. Uh, we recruited a lot of minorities. And this is really critically important because, um, again, due to really misguided work in the past, uh, some of our underserved communities have a natural skepticism towards participating in trials, as in you are testing stuff on me. But that nothing could be farther from the truth, at least not, not in, in modern America and, and certainly not at UC Davis, is that we're testing things for you. And what that means is that if we don't include every person from every background in our clinical studies, we don't know if it works the same for you know, a 40-year-old white male as a 62-year-old African-American woman. There are differences in how people respond to different medications. And so it is critical that we get people from every community participating in the clinical studies, number one. And then when the drug is available, we make sure we get it to the people um, who are most at risk um, and in an equitable fashion. And we are absolutely committed to that as well. And so being, uh, so we're trying to be a leader, not only in doing the research, but in making sure that the application of that research results in every community being well protected. Yeah. So um, the question as far as Pfizer, you know, you see the, 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 the footage of them, the little vials when they're filling the vaccines. Why can't they ramp it up? Why can't they, you know, 24 hours a day, bring in more people? Why, why can't Pfizer, you know, quadruple the, the output? And maybe they are, but it's going across the globe to other countries. Um, so they are, and it's going across the globe to other countries. Um, uh, again, if you believe the news stories, I don't want to repeat things that I don't have primary source information on, mm -hmm. but it was supposedly offered to the United States to lock in additional doses and they chose not to, and they are going to different places from Pfizer. Don't know mm -hmm. about Moderna, don't have those details. But is, but, is, is, the, uh, is the one that started the other day in the UK, is that Pfizer too? Or somebody yes, else? Yes, that's Pfizer. That's Pfizer as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Pfizer's the one that's the first out of the gate. Um, Canada also approved Pfizer. So we're sort of competing mm -hmm. with all of our friends, unfortunately. Yeah. And um, when they did ramp up, I mean, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. So, because um, I, I like to leave politics out of this. It was an amazing job to make sure that many vaccine candidates had pre-orders so that if their drug turned out to be okay, there'd be a stockpile to deliver to the American people. Pfizer actually wasn't one of those. They had such faith in their, in their, uh, in their production capacity and in the, in the, in their drug that they just pre-manufactured it. But um, the, the federal government in this one instance actually did a really good job in this regard. Mm -hmm. And safeguarding. Okay, so the other thing too is, you know, there's this, I've seen people online and politicians and others saying, we need to make sure we take care of essential workers and farm workers and all this and teachers. And that's right. But if you look at, you know, California has 40 million people. Uh, we have 2 million people who are in the healthcare and essential worker field for frontline workers. Um, that's not to mention seniors, older people. I heard the three O's. You had to be older, obese or other. They want you to focus on getting that vaccine right away. And then there's, healthcare workers and teachers and farm workers and other people on the front lines, uh, food service workers, people that are working right now in, in grocery stores. And so we're nowhere near um, the number where we need. So how do we pick and choose winners and losers? Who gets it first? That's a tough job. I mean, even, even among UC Davis, there's not even enough doses to deal with all your UCD employees who are working in the hospital. So how, how, do, you, how do you focus? Right, so I think for, this is, this is difficult, but the good news is we should get about 2.1 million doses in the state of California before the end of the year. Uh, 
So we should get most of the healthcare workers and essential workers vaccinated, not all, but yeah. most um, by the beginning of 2021. Um, at UC Davis, you know, we're getting a couple thousand doses, right? I got 14,000 people, right? So how yeah. do we do that? We had a committee of medical leaders sit down and say, okay, how do we distribute the vaccine to create the greatest degree of safety and mitigate the greatest degree of harm were someone to be exposed? And, and you know, and, and it's not actually rocket science, right? It's people who are in the emergency department, people who are in the front lines dealing with flu symptoms before we even get a diagnosis. People mm -hmm. who are in our ICUs taking care of COVID patients who are having difficulty breathing. Um, and then our nurses and others, and it's not just nurses and doctors, it is everybody in these units, from environmental service workers, to food service workers, to nurses, to uh, people who help with lifting uh, our patients. Um, we're making sure that people who are the most exposed will be the first to get it. And then we will slowly expand that till everybody who's potentially at risk and putting their life at risk for providing frontline healthcare has it. Yep. Okay, let's start getting to our questions. We got a bunch on, on a vaccine. So I'll just go and read them. Um, the last one I'll read here is the UK administered Pfizer vaccine shots today. It's the eighth. When will these shots be available in the US? I think um, you answered that um, starting at UC Davis on Monday. They want to know why the UK, UK beat us. I would assume that you said that the UK's equivalent of the FDA approved the drug a few days before our FDA did, right? Correct. Right. Exactly. Okay. So let's get to the top. Um, question is, I'm a student nurse and have had all of my clinicals at the UC Davis Med Center since COVID-19 hit in our area. I'm wondering when I should expect to get a vaccine uh, given since recent guidance. Given my status as a student, do I lose priority for the vaccine and wait until spring or should I expect to be vaccinated with the rest of the healthcare professionals? Who should I look to for guidance on this? My university, my doctor, or the hospital where I do my clinicals? So far, none of them have provided any information. So um, people who are, so for our own students, um, they are being treated the same way as our employees, which is the first step, the first tranche, if you will, first group, there are people who are spending at least 20 hours a week in a uh, risky situation and will do so repetitively for the next month. I mean, that's what we're, you know, as we think of how do we divvy up an insufficient number. Um, I don't think to be quite honest with you, that we have considered external rotators. And so I'm gonna defer your question, but I promise you <laughs> it'll get attention by tomorrow because we need to decide and make sure that people who are at risk are not left out in the cold just because of their quote unquote designation. So if, yeah. so we need to make sure about that. I mean, that's part, that is the obligation of leadership is to make sure that that we're concerned with human beings and their risk level and what they're doing to care for COVID patients, not who they work for. And just for me, what does she mean by this? I'm thinking that she, he or she means, says I'm a student nurse and I've had all of my clinicals. Well, her, she's rotating through our various units, getting clinical experience before she graduates as a nurse. Um, my guess, I don't know where, where she goes to school, but she's probably not at UC Davis because we don't do undergraduate nursing. We do graduate yeah. student nursing. Um, yeah. And we have yeah. lots of rotators, both for uh, external medical students and external nurses, um, because we have a rich amount of material on which to learn. We have very complex patients. Um, so, but we need to make sure that everybody in our charge is, has equal access to the protections based on the tiering that we've developed. Okay, uh, next question. How soon after one gets the first dose of a two-part vaccine must they get the second part? If the second part is delayed for any reason, is the vaccination considered unsuccessful? Just concern about availability consequences. Right, so I have three three. Good answers to that. Number one, the federal government has withheld an equal number of uh, vaccine uh, mm -hmm. in its care to make sure that every single person who gets a first dose will have a second dose. So don't worry about that. Pipeline is secure. Um, the second part of this is 21 days is the answer. And the third part is um, it probably doesn't matter if it's exactly 21 days. Um, it's really about rechallenging your immune system to generate an even larger response. You can't get it before 21 days because that's how long your immune system takes to get ready to attack a new assault. 
Okay. Last thing, yesterday, because the news is always changing, Pfizer announced that um, it looks like a great degree of that 95% uh, of efficacy for its uh, vaccine was achieved within the first 10 days after the first injection. So even if you're delayed, you're still gonna have a very good chance at having a very good immune response were you to be exposed to COVID-19 and for it to try to get a foothold in your body. So all good news right now. Um, we were not expecting that there would be uh, such positive news around uh, immunity that developed 10 days after uh, um, your first injection. So that's really good news. Maybe not as strong and as pervasive as when you get the second shot, but some immunity is better than no immunity. Yep, rather, rather a 50% than 0%. So Exactly. Um, question three, what if you don't want to take the vaccine? Will we have to take it? Will our rights... Uh, not be protected. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer this because this, this is a, you know, state law question as well. Um, there have been laws about vaccine for public school um, that has not been proposed. This is strictly voluntary. Um, you know, if you don't want to take it, you don't have to, you'll probably be more susceptible to be getting ill. And so it's, it's your own risk. Um, hopefully that herd immunity will protect you down the road as well. Um, so, and so some people, um, maybe they can't take it. Maybe they have really severe allergy um, impacts, right? Is that an issue? Yeah, well, we actually don't know. There are two patients in the entire trial, both of whom had severe anaphylactic, meaning overblown, gigantic allergic reactions to things like bee stings. They carried EpiPens with them all around. Um, we're not talking about people with hay fever. Okay, next question. The current vaccine information sheets given by pediatricians to parents seem designed to frighten rather than inform. They emphasize very rare complications. Will the new COVID vaccines have the same frightening language or more balanced view of the risk benefit? I kind of think of this as when I see these TV commercials on heart medication or whatever, at the end they list all the horrible things that's gonna happen to you. And you're like, why would I wanna take that? So I assume this is similar to that, right? It is, um, it's, it, you know, in the guise of trying to give complete information, um, we scare people because people, this is normal human behavior. It's not like I'm smarter or I'm not smart. It's just like every single human being has a really hard time understanding what does it mean one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, right? We just, we just, we can't comprehend those very small risks and they loom much larger in our mind than they really are. And yet we're obligated to, to tell people that there can be these rare risks. So I'm sorry. I don't think that the, you know, cause we don't, it's not possible to get people to really understand what these really itsy bitsy risks are. Um, and I, I, like to, I like to say things like, you're more likely to die in a car accident driving from your apartment to the grocery store than you are to have like a major complication from a vaccine. Um, I mean, that's kind of the truth, right? You don't worry about getting in your car every day, even though you know you could be broadsided or something, right? So, so understanding that, that the, in, in the relative risk world, it's very low. And right now there have been no really serious reactions at all reported to date with the Pfizer vaccine. But there's only 44,000 people. We don't really know about the rare risks, right? That can occur one in a hundred thousand or one in a million until a lot more people have gotten uh, this vaccine. So I don't want to say it's perfectly safe, but I will say this. I am confident that it is as safe as all other vaccines right now. I believe that the data has not been influenced by politics. I will get it the moment it's offered to me. I'm tiered like everybody else and I am not at the front of the bunch. Um, but when it's offered to me, I will take it because I believe in it and because I've actually seen what COVID can do to people. I've seen people yeah. struggling to breathe and I've seen people get really, really sick and I've seen them leave our hospital and, 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 and not be back to their normal selves for quite a long time. And so the risk of the vaccine is infinitely less than a virus that still has at least a 1% mortality rate. We're not talking one out of a hundred for vaccine risks. We're talking one out of a million. It's a big difference. Okay. Next question is about the vaccine in kids. Um, the question is, I read that COVID-19 vaccine won't be immediately be available for children. Kaiser is currently enrolling 12 to 18 year olds for a vaccine trial. Is the availability of the vaccine for children dependent on current clinical trials? What is the estimated timeline for when it will be available? 
Great question. Um, the FDA and the data that was just released today, actually an hour and a half ago, says that it's approved for, for uh, young adults down to the age of 16. Um, below that, there just is no data. And there's a reason for this. And it is a desire, well, first of all, we, it's just about protecting children. If we're gonna test a new drug in large uh, exposure, well, we wanted to do it to adults before we do it to the most vulnerable, which are our children um, and who have the longest lives ahead of them. Having said that, I'm pretty confident that it will be uh, found to be safe and effective in children too, but it's, it's uh, drug trials like the one that Kaiser is doing. It's absolutely essential to make sure that we're making the right choice for our children. Um, third and not last, the reason that uh, probably they're just doing 12 to 18 year olds is we already know that really young kids don't have the right types of receptors uh, in your nose to actually let the virus gain the foothold. And that's why elementary schools seem to be relatively immune to uh, this among the children. That is the virus has a very hard time getting, gaining a foothold in very young children. So I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful that we'll all be immune soon. Okay, uh, another qu vaccine questions. I would like to know if this is truly a vaccine or is it like a flu shot? I hear the media use the word vaccine, but I have read it's really only a flu shot that persons will have to get it each year in hopes uh, it helps of, of not getting the vaccine, I mean the virus. Uh, similar to the flu shot, people now get seasonally. Please clarify. Okay, so uh, the flu shot is a vaccine. It, it operates just like this, it injects part of uh, uh, the viruses so that, that your body sees it following the injection, mounts a response, and your body has a memory of this, and then the next time the flu attacks you, it mounts a full-blown uh, defense against getting sick. That's how this vaccine works too. They're all vaccines. Um, some vaccines last a lifetime. Like I said, measles, get it once, you're good to go. Um, others, like the flu, because the flu virus itself mutates regularly every year. And so, and there are usually multiple versions of the flu virus, the influenza virus, that are out there in the world. We don't know which one is gonna really take a foothold. So we try and cover what we think is most likely to happen, but we're always a little bit behind mother nature and that's why that doesn't work perfectly. In this case, coronavirus doesn't seem uh, to be mutating in, uh, in, in the same way, the same speed, for part of its critical pathway to actually cause disease. So um, it may be that we don't need to get it or it may need, we need to get it a little booster like we do for tetanus, um, or it, it may be an every year thing. We'll know within the year, but so we'll see. Okay, uh, second question to ask about kids and, and forced vaccinations. We mentioned that on, on earlier, but she asked, or he or she asked one, the issue here, how can we be assured the vaccine is safe given the rapid creation and short testing period? Well, it, the rapid creation was just a miracle of modern science and we should be thankful for that. Um, the short testing period, um, it is a little shorter than we would like. Obviously, if COVID were really like the flu, which it is not, and it had a very minimal very minimal impact on killing people, which it has, then yeah, we'd take our time and maybe test it out for a season and see what happens. But the scourge of COVID-19 and the number of deaths it is causing is so far in excess of any potential harm caused by the vaccine that the FDA is making the right choice for the benefit of our society and for the benefit of our loved ones to get this out to us. Now, Having said that, we don't, like I said, we don't know if there's a rare event out there, but they did test 44,000 people. It's a lot of people to undergo a clinical trial and not to see a single major negative event. And so I'm confident that, like I said, it's safe. I'm going to be willing to take it. I hope that you're willing to take it. Um, because if we all don't take it, then we'll never get to herd immunity and we will never get rid of the virus and we won't ever get back to normal. Okay, we'll get to that back to normal in a few secs. Um, Question here, now that we know that the PCR is extremely inaccurate, why are we continuing to base restrictions on the number of, on the number of cases when we cannot determine if the positives are really COVID infections or not? Well, okay. Um, 
I am going to have to take a step back and say um, the PCR actually is extremely accurate. We have a 99.7%. What, what, what is PCR? Okay. Tell us. Uh, well, so that's the type of test that one look, looks at when you're trying to see if the virus and, and, and it's, and it's in, is in your body, right, is, is actually present. Um, and, uh, and it's a, it, it, um, I'm trying to think about how you explain this. It, it, amp it amplifies the signal um, in a way that makes it very difficult to miss. And that's why it's much better than things that are called antigen tests, um, which are the more rapid tests. Um, it's the rapid tests that are relatively inaccurate. And I use relatively, they're about 70% accurate um, as opposed to the PCR, which is between 99 and 99.9% uh, .9 accurate. So, um, so the restrictions are not based per se um, on the number of cases. Um, and there's almost never a false positive. That is the problem with any of the tests, PCR, you get a positive test, you're positive. PCR, you get a negative test, you're negative. But on some of these other tests that are out there that are not quite as accurate, um, you miss and undercount the number of COVID cases. So going by the number of cases is actually a, a still a, a pretty good way to do things. There's a however. We also know that people are positive who are in the age range of 20 to 35, don't require as routinely hospitalizations, don't tax the medical system. Um, as a matter, and their, their, main, their main threat to society is that they're gonna pass it to the, their elderly loved ones who will be in the hospital. Um, so the number of cases and where it spreads and in what populations it spreads is not as important as the number of hospitalizations and the number of people who are, are uh, trying to get into an ICU when they become critically ill with COVID-19. And so I believe that uh, what the uh, governor and uh, Secretary Galley have done in terms of making sure there's sufficient uh, ICU capacity to take care of uh, you, any of you out there who might get terribly ill, is pretty reasonable. Um, and uh, I don't know if 15% is the right number, but certainly understanding that we don't want to leave people on the street without care, right? No one no yeah. want to do mm -hmm. that. Okay, let, let's get to that now. The um, stay-at-home order, obviously, it's very timely. It hits tonight at, uh, at midnight here in Sacramento. Yeah. Um, so no. last, last night, you can go out there and grab a bite to eat, and uh, I will say that... Um, my girls and I are going to go out there and venture out and grab a bite to eat in a little bit. So uh, this is the last night for outdoor dining for a while. And we understand we're going to, um, we're going to focus on the rules here in our home in Sacramento, of course. Uh, maybe you can, can, can help us understand some basic things that I've, that I've had asked of me. So th the notion is where we're putting these in regions where the ICU bed capacity dips below 15%. Right. So one question I've heard is what's the typical ICU capacity this time of year anyway? In December is flu season, you know, people's so like, it's, what's normal? Because we, we, want, we want to compare apples to apples. Right. So, uh, well, that's a great question, Kevin. Instead of a arbitrary 15%, right, they're, they're, we probably should have said, do we have the normal number of ICU beds that we usually have available through this season. Um, UC Davis never has an ICU bed, honestly. Um, but we're always filled up because we always have sick people. And if we get a really, really sick person, we, we figure out a way to take care of the person who's least sick and you know, uh, in, a, in a unit adjacent to the ICU or something like that. So we're always making decisions and triaging people about who needs the ICU the most. Um, and um, so, I don't know if 15%, we, we will never, we've never had, I've been here two and a half years at UC Davis. I don't believe I've ever seen a day at UC Davis where there was a 15% empty bed. Having said that, I think that there is, there is something here to this, which is we just need to make sure, I mean, we are for right, just again, for the record, we're the busiest we've ever been in the two and a half years I've been here, actually in UC Davis's history. Um, every single ICU bed is filled. Um, we have about 20 uh, of our 84 beds filled with COVID-19 patients right now. And uh, we have somewhere between 80 and 90 total patients in the hospital. It's not that much when you think about it. We're, we routinely have about 700 patients in a day are admitted or just are in, uh, admitted at one point or another. Um, so it's a, it's a small percentage, but it still taxes us because there's all these other diseases out there 
heart attacks and strokes and people with pneumonia that are unrelated to COVID or, or, or people who break their hip or all these other things that go on that we really have to take care of. And, um, and I think that's also uh, what um, the state is concerned about, just making sure that the health systems can continue to function, they can take care of the people who have COVID-19 and they can take care of some of the people who don't have COVID-19 because what we saw in March and April were too many people delaying their essential and necessary care. And now they're showing up with much more significant disease and they're, they're much more ill than they should be. So being able to take care of everyone is our goal. And I think the state is aligned with us on that. Distance learning, kid issues right here. So um, <laughs> next question is, is uh, we, we hear a lot, is if you look at the Sacramento region, it's, it's not just Sacramento's Yolo, it's Amador County, El Dorado, and all these outskirt counties. Um, why does it make sense to have this uh, stay at home order for this large reason as opposed to more um, uh, uh, focused areas? Right. So I'm not sure I entire, and, I, and I'm sure they're tr what they were trying to do was prevent putting forward a complete statewide lockdown. Um, and so can you, sorry, Kevin, um, they were trying to put forward a, uh, they were trying to prevent putting forward a complete statewide lockdown and providing a way out that didn't depend on state data because we're such a large state um, that we really have local epidemics. We don't really have a state uh, epidemic, um, just different climates, different people, different, different, uh, different hospital support systems. Um, does it make sense for it to extend to a lot of counties that may have extremely little disease? Um, not necessarily. And um, you know that's something again for the state to consider and reconsider. They can change their mind. Um, I think where cases are rapidly rising and where the percentage of individuals in a particular area um, show a high uh, positive rate and a large number per 100,000 population, um, it's really important to actually limit, out, not outside, limit social interactions and limit group gatherings, right? Um, outside is actually pretty safe for the record. I walk around the Capitol or I try to every day and I'm not wearing a mask because I'm not worried that if I pass someone in the open air that I'm gonna actually be exposed to sufficient virus to actually get sick. On the other hand, when I'm in my elevator or walking in my, the door of my building, my mask goes right up because being inside in this weather with a large number of people sporting the disease and a large number who may not know they have the disease, when you're inside, you need to protect yourself and wear a mask at all times. Mm -hmm. Not okay, so, your so, so, so let's talk about some of those outdoor activities. So um, we, we, of course, we have a stay at home order for three weeks. Um, what about going and going for a walk in a neighborhood and you're walking with you know, a friend or a couple people should you have masks on while you're walking outside in a neighborhood? Um, if you can, well, first of all, if you're walking alone, the answer is I don't believe it's necessary. If you're walking with someone from your household, it's not necessary. If you're walking with casual acquaintances who have their own set of casual acquaintances and you're less than six feet separated, then you should probably wear a mask, yes. Yeah, is it even when you're walking outside, with those people? Be yes. because even walking outside, because we've heard reports that if you're outside, and there's even a trace wind out there of less than, I think, a couple miles an hour that, you, that you're, you're pretty safe. So if you're out there walking and it's the winter time right now, there's a little breeze going on, why would you need to wear a mask if you're outside in the elements anyway? Right. Well, the, the thing is when you're walking outside, um, and I don't know how long you're walking for, I walk for an hour, um, and you know, you're talking to each other and you're turning to each other there's the chance that you're gonna be sharing enough of your respiratory droplets because you're, we're like this, you know, we're, it's, it's like you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're right on top of one another, if you will. If you were to walk side by side and, 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 and not, not turn, or turn to each other, right? So, and, um, and, and just, you know, talk out in the air and you're at least three to six, three, at least three feet apart, you're probably okay. Again, six feet is best. Um, and um, because we know how far respiratory droplets carry without wind. And that's about three feet routinely for mm -hmm. sometimes up to six feet, but routinely up to three feet. 
But most people, when they walk together, they walk shoulder to shoulder and they turn their head to speak to that individual. And then they're just basically blowing their virus into their face. And you yeah. need a lot so more than trace wound. Yeah, so we, we want to have, um, you know, humans, we like socialization. We want to encourage people to be healthy and, and not be isolated. So go for a walk outside. Try to try to distance yourself if if you if you're not if you if if you have a soft talking voice and you can't hear the other person, uh, wear a mask is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just so common sense. Just staying away from sharing too much of your spit. That's it. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about the the the, the three week um, number. If you said that UC Davis is never at 15%, you're always, you know, zero essentially for your capacity. How do we expect in three weeks we're going to get up, you know, that number is going to be satisfactory to lift the stay at home order or this, or, we, or, or are we setting us, ourselves up for great disappointment? Um, so, well, I'm going to talk about the good news for the last week. Um, our number of COVID cases, both in the hospital and the ICU, while not the, exactly the same, has risen at a very slow rate over the last few days. It rose, wow, quick, the two weeks before that, you know, quickly surpassing the numbers that we had in, in, in uh, March, April, and in uh, August, September. Um, having said that, um, I, you're right. We... <laughs> As soon as I get, as soon as we're like into this and we, we understand what's going on, I think it'll be very important to have a discussion um, with the uh, California HHS secretary or others to talk about, well, what we, you know, maybe tweaking the return because we will never, I mean, 15% for us is 12 to 13 empty beds. We will yeah. never have 12 to 13 empty beds at UC Davis. And so that puts a tremendous burden on the other hospitals to make up for our never having ICU beds. So what I'm hoping is that, that um, once we see how the curve is going and the actual census in our hospital, and we can start talking about maybe not how many empty beds there are, but what percentage of our ICU beds are displacing other patients with COVID patients. Right now it's about 25%. Maybe that's the, a better metric. So I think we need to have further discussion I think it's okay as a start. Um, it acknowledges that that overwhelming the health systems are bad, but we also want to make sure that we're not making it impossible to get out of the penalty box. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one of the one of the issues that people have said over and over, people that think these restrictions are too much, they say, "Hey, um, the mortality rate isn't what it was at the beginning." We have more and more treatments. Um, you know, the president got sick and he was able to get phenomenal treatment, but that's an example that people get sick, aren't necessarily dying. Um, so even though we do have a great increase in number of people testing positive, the death rate, while a great number in the United States, you know, is not as huge of a number as far as the percent, percentage of people who are, who are testing positive. All right. Well, I'm going to take issue with almost everything you just said, Kevin. So okay, I, I'm all, just saying. By the way, I'm not saying that I believe all that. I know. Stuff, no, no, I know. So, but yeah, I'm going to talk. That's about what this. we hear quite often. Okay. More than three thousand Americans died. That's more than died than died on 9/11, and we went to war over one day's mortality, and yet we've had a hundred days like this, and we seem to want to fight ourselves rather than the virus. Second thing I would say is I've heard from sheriffs because it, it's all over the airwaves, we're not gonna enforce this mask mandate or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? You enforce the speed limit. You know that in a single day, more people are lost to COVID than on every highway and road in the United States of America from a car accident. One day, more than everybody who dies from a car accident in the United States. And yet we, enforce not running stop signs and we enforce 55, 65 mile per hour speed limits. Yes, we do that. And we actually ask people, you know, to belt up or get a ticket, click it or ticket, right? So we've already agreed that we're willing mm -hmm. and must put some restraints on ourselves in order to protect our fellow citizens. That's what speed limits and not running stop signs and wearing a seat belt are all about. Okay and they protect us too, just like a mask. So 
But then you ask, well, what about this 99%? Well, there's 330 million Americans. If 99% of people don't die, but 3.3 million do, yeah, I'm not okay with that. That's a lot of people. Actually, more than a quarter million is a lot of people. That's, that's far more than we're lost in the Vietnam War, where the country tore itself apart. We need to get a little bit of a grip around how serious this is. And there's been too much misinformation and disinformation. This is a serious disease. And it is at least 10 times more lethal than the flu. It is not the flu. And we still don't know about long-term consequences, which the flu doesn't really have. Yeah. And, and so um, I can only say that the COVID-19 is real. It's dangerous. It's killing a lot of people in comparison to anything else in the United States that is preventable. And we need to take it as seriously as humanly possible. So let me ask this hypothetical. And of course, we're not doing it. Some, some would say we shouldn't have these restrictions. This is why we're America. We're great. We believe in our freedoms. And people, people can make their own choices. There are some in my, my legislature that say, you know, families, individuals are best to make their own decisions. So what if we didn't have any restrictions? What if we didn't have any dining and bar restrictions? What do you think we would see? I mean, there are probably places around our globe that aren't doing anything about it. So are they having their hospitals overflowing? And, and yes. um, you know, yeah, so what, what would happen here in California if we had no restrictions right now? What would it look like? Um, we would see tens of thousands of people die. Maybe up to, you know, like I said, it's 99% don't die. But 1% to 40 million is a lot of people. That's 400,000 Californians. 400,000 people that somebody loves, that is somebody's family. Mm -hmm. That's like ridiculous, frankly. And as for, well, it's my right. Sorry, an issue with this. It's not your right to go 100 miles an hour on the highway and put my life at risk. And when you mm -hmm. don't wear a mask, you put my life at risk. And so I'm here to say that it's okay to ask people to conform to publicly safe behaviors on behalf of their neighbors and neighboring citizens. And we're only looking at a few more months. And if we don't do this, if we don't do this, the, the, the numbers are that another maybe quarter million will die before we get enough vaccine out there. And those numbers are staggering. You can't even imagine that. Just imagine the last time you went to someone's funeral where someone died too young from cancer or a motor vehicle accident or an unexpected heart attack and the, the amount of anguish that caused in their immediate family and their loved ones and their friends. And take a moment to think about that and then think about that happening literally every minute of the day because that's what COVID-19 is doing. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell to families right now going com coming to the holidays and in, we're telling people to cut back and limit, um, you know, wh what, what, what's, what's, the, what's the most responsible thing that they could do? And well, the, what could they do if they wanted to practice, um, you know, distancing, but, you know, but also see their loved ones? What would you recommend to them? Right. Well, I think the most important thing that someone can do is to get a test um, when they arrive at their destination, quarantine for a couple of days, and you know that's good. Maybe get a test a couple of days before they leave uh, to visit their their loved ones or before a gathering is occurring. Gathering inside, they're your family, but they're not safe. If they don't live with you, have not been constantly exposed to their germs, they're no different than strangers. Their entire set of casual acquaintances may or may not have passed along the COVID-19 virus to them. And this is especially true for uh, people in that 18 to 35 age range who don't are not as affected symptomatically, um, but tend to be more social and tend to actually have, uh, are really driving the case, the case rates these days. And if you go home, even though you're fine and you haven't tested yourself and then you share it with your 75 year old grandparent, they will likely die. And that's why this is so important. Mm -hmm. So how do you do it safely? Well, number one is you can not eat right on top of each other and practice some physical distancing at the dining table. If you can dine outside, there's any option to do that at all, that's even better. An in-between option 
open the windows and open the doors. And as Kevin said, even a small breeze is enough to dissipate the virus, article, virus particles in the air. So there's a lot of things that we can do that don't that are a little different, right? Because the whole idea of the holidays is the warmth that bringing all of us together brings. And we want to hug each other and we want to gather around the fire, at least in Northern California. Um, we want to gather around the fire and we want to gather with our friends and our family. And the more people that we see, the more risk we place ourselves out. The other option, wear a mask and, uh, and you know, take it off and don't eat right on top of each other. That's another option. Mm -hmm. I know they're not, okay. they're not satisfying. I apologize. No, I, that's I'm so right. looking forward. But, but Christmas 2021. Yes, giving us unvarnished information here. Um, question from the audience. What are the, what are the treatments in place for individuals that are experiencing severe COVID-19? Uh, any effective new treatments being implemented? Um, unfortunately, right now, the answer is no. Um, the only drug that really is shown to work well on um, people with the severe disease is steroids, dexamethasone primarily. Um, the other drugs, the drug that President Trump got and remdesivir alike are really best used when people present with a beginning case before the virus has a foothold and before the inflammation occurs in the lung, which is a reaction to the virus, not the virus itself usually. And then you block further, uh, further uh, virus uh, getting a foothold in your body. And so it really does work. The Regeneron drug uh, really that President Trump got actually does work. It's extremely expensive. We've set up a couple of infusion centers around Sacramento uh, for people who meet criteria to get the drug. And that would be people who are in an early stage of their illness who have a lot of uh, pre-existing conditions that would make them very likely to die if the virus got a very strong foothold. So um, we've started giving infusions of this, um, but there are only so many doses around. So uh, that is being uh, you know, given out to just those people at greatest risk of actually uh, having a mortal event from the virus. Okay. Let me see what other questions we have here. But we are hopeful. So just, again, I like to just, you know, yeah. great to have a research university in your backyard. Uh, Tim Albertson, uh, our chair of medicine, who uh, was uh, led the Pfizer trial, vaccine trial, um, is actually starting to enroll patients in a uh, trial of stem cells to reverse and ameliorate the lung inflammation that is usually causes the difficulty breathing and the death. And so uh, we're starting a trial. I think we're trying to roll our first patient today. And so hopefully that trial will work out and we'll have a different answer in a few months about having a successful treatment for the uh, for severe cases. Okay, uh, when, when will we start to see the effects of the holiday season? Um, I think we have seen the Thanksgiving effect already. Um, you know, normally you uh, catch the disease um, and then you begin to exhibit symptoms somewhere between two and seven days, usually four to five days. You know, we're well past that um, in terms of people getting sick, but then they've gotten sick, then they come back home, then they share it with their friends. So it's usually two cycles or about two weeks and we're two weeks after Thanksgiving. So uh, mm -hmm. exactly. So I think we've seen it and I, that makes sense because we've seen a leveling off over the last few days after this meteoric rise the last few weeks. Um, so I am, believe that uh, we'll be okay. I'm knocking on wood. Um, I think we'll be okay for the next week or two. And then when people go home to uh, celebrate the winter holidays, we're gonna see this all over again. And I'm just hoping the numbers have come down sufficiently that we can deal with it because Mm. When people get together, they, they spread cheer and warmth and COVID-19. Yep. So it's really those first few weeks of January that we're concerned about. Yes. Okay. It was recently announced that CDC may shorten the recommended quarantine time for exposed individuals. Is that accurate? Yes. They are uh, recommending that if you test negative um, and uh, you haven't demonstrated any symptoms within seven days, you can let yourself go. So no, no longer 14. Correct. That's there if okay. you test negative. 
And they, and I believe yeah. that testing is ideally done at day four. And then if you're negative on your test and then you continue not to exhibit any symptoms by day seven, I think that, I think, believe that's the recommendation. I have to go back because it's, it's new and, uh, and make sure that I'm quoting that exactly correctly. I think you already answered this. What percentage of the population in California, United States, worldwide would need to be vaccinated for COVID-19 to reach herd immunity? Right, so 60% of people six. have to have antibodies. And I think about 10% of the United States, by the time the vaccine rolls out, will have had the disease. So 60% need to have a combo of either the vaccine or the antibodies from already having it. Yes. About 10% have been infected, so we need 50% yes. to get the test, to get that the vaccine. Is. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so our, our last few moments here. Um, you now, when we talked in April, a lot of uncertainty, didn't know, we didn't know what was happening as much. And now we've been through this um, and we have the vaccines rolling out. So how optimistic are you that we'll get back to a relative normal place in the near future? And my kids can go back to school and um, you know we can get back to our life. Um, well, I can say that my home institution uh, so ably led by uh, Chancellor May uh, through these difficult times uh, is uh, making plans to be back in full force in September. Um, and I believe that we all be back in full force by September. I can't promise before then, but I am highly confident that the United States will bounce back and we will be running at full tilt in less than a year, probably nine months. And it just, again, if we can just all, just, just all try and stop spreading it, long enough for us to get the vaccine out there and protect everyone, this will just be a distant and bad memory. Yeah, so why nine months? If, if you think we can get enough vaccines out in the next three or four months with Pfizer and Moderna, just those two right there are 20 or 30% and all we need is either one of those to ramp up or get a third one. Right, well, I think that it will take that amount of time number one, to get it all uh, ramped up. It's not, it's really an overnight issue. Although I, I want to be wrong. Kevin, I want to be wrong so much. I, <laughs> I'd like to see us all vaccinated in the next 30 days. The thing is, it's not that easy to reach that many people. Um, and yeah. uh, really, so there may be areas of the country that uh, reach herd immunity faster than others. Again, it's not, oh, the whole country has to have herd immunity. It's your local area where, where everybody lives and interacts. And if that is uh, at 60%, you could achieve herd immunity. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping for instance, when the healthcare workers are all vaccinated, that we will have a certain herd immunity within our healthcare facility because nobody, the virus will not be able to get a foothold in transferring itself between our employees. Um, and, uh, and, and it will be snuffed out if you will, uh, by it not finding a, uh, a hospitable host uh, to infect. So um, you can get micro areas of herd immunity. And so encourage yourself and your friends, your schoolmates, and everybody who will listen around you to get the vaccine as soon as it is mm -hmm. offered. It offers the greatest protection, not only to them yeah. and you, to everyone around you. And how do we know when an area has herd immunity? When a community, a state, a country, the how, case do you, how, how do you rate test? Will dive. The case positivity rate will dive. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward. There's, a, there's some bright, there's, a, there's one bright lining. Um, we've seen the flu season so far not get a foothold. And that's because we're wearing, a lot of people are wearing masks and practicing social distancing and it's spread the exact yeah. same way. So that's a positive, that's a positive note. People got the flu vaccine and people's work to prevent COVID-19 is also preventing a bad flu season. So. We're very fortunate because that's freed up some of the space that would otherwise go to flu victims. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good. Well, I'm, I'm optimistic um, seeing the vaccines roll out uh, this week across our country. Um, I, I'm, I'm ready to take mine. I'm, I'm not an essential worker, so I'm not going to, 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 uh, to jump in line, but I, I would take mine first if I need to show people that it's safe. So, um, but I'll wait until it's readily available for, for people in my age demographic and my, uh, you know, healthcare situation. So I think I'll be towards the end of the list, but um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm upbeat and think that we're very uh, close to, um, to, to getting uh, past this chapter of our this United is the States beginning, history. This is the beginning <clears throat> of the end. And um, 
You know, I've likened this to D-Day. Once we landed in Normandy and we, we landed on the continent, it was almost an assurance that we were gonna win the war, but it took a long time to slog through France and Germany to do that. And that's kind of where we are right now. We've got to, we've got to be resolute. We, we can't drop our helmets and our rifles and say, oh, we landed in, in Normandy. Everybody's gonna, you know, they're gonna retreat. COVID-19 has not retreated. Just have to redouble our commitment to staying safe, staying healthy and wait to the end, which is coming soon. Yep. All righty. Well, thank you for your, for your time today, Dr. Lebarski. And uh, we appreciate your insight and to uh, informing us about uh, what, what, the, what the realities are in facts versus fiction for COVID-19. So and thank you for leading our great UC Davis health system. So hopefully we'll see you soon. And uh, until then, have a thank good night. Bye-bye. Thank you for allowing me to talk here.